coming, uh, all the students, fellows, and faculty. As usual, we probably will have a ratio of uh, one to five in terms of here in place and uh, live or streaming. Hello, everybody at home, and uh, then also archive. Uh, I, I'm Jonathan Weiner, professor in health policy management, also active in division of health sciences and informatics, and uh, the director of the of the public health informatics training program. You know, we have public health and uh, and uh, nursing and, and medicine on the certificate side, and also uh, the director of the newly launched Bloomberg School-based uh, uh, CFIT Center for Population Health IT. Uh, we're, we're always grateful to Harold and the DHSI for these grand rounds, but I'm pleased that starting this year, we at CFIT are going to uh, co-sponsor, and this will be the second, Dr. Loons was the first, uh, co-sponsor uh, some presenters who are talking about population health informatics. And of course, over the year and years, we will further elaborate what is population health informatics or public health informatics, you know, relative to clinical informatics. Uh, but a starting point is it's uh, more than one patient. And I'm very pleased uh, today uh, to introduce uh, the new assistant director of, of CFIT, a new uh, 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 recently approved assistant uh, professor at the Bloomberg School of Public Health and Health Policy Management, and soon, uh, I'm sure, uh, although the paperwork is still uh, underway, uh, a new faculty member for the Division of Health Sciences Informatics, which is always so wonderful when we're able to add uh, well-trained informaticists here, here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Hadi Karazi is an MD, PhD, uh, an MD from uh, his uh, very, very global man, Hadi, is uh, original native Tehran, but he's also uh, German and Canadian and uh, now American, so we're really wonderful to have Hadi. He got his PhD and master's in informatics at Dalhousie in, in Canada, and most recently we're able to snag him from University of Indiana, Regenstrief, which many of you know is one of the fonts of, uh, of healthcare and clinical informatics. And so Hadi, as you can see, will be uh, uh, talking for about 45 minutes live. Uh, on, on a really important topic, clinical decision support, you know, both related to electronic health records and personal health records, and uh, something that will appeal to a very um, wide audience, uh, those of you, you know, classic informaticists, but also those of you interested in population health and, uh, and uh, health care issues. And as usual, we will uh, let Hadi speak for about 45 minutes, and those of you at home, either now live or archived as you watch this uh, after today's date, uh, can follow along. Uh, I will give him a sign at about uh, 15 minutes before we end, which here live will be about 1 o'clock. And then I hope you can think questions uh, uh, here in the audience. And if you're listening uh, live, uh, I'm told that, that the active group knows how to uh, contact us. We'll be monitoring it anytime during the presentations. It's at JH. Uh, informatics GR, is it? But uh, that should be written somewhere, and some of you know that. And if any of you are watching it archive, I'm sure Dr. Karazi will be very happy to answer any questions, and you can find him uh, on, on the JSU website. So, Hadi, I'll turn it over to you. And again, welcome to Johns Hopkins, and uh, you know, thank you for participating in, in uh, the Grand Rounds. And again, um, he will also talk a little bit more about, about CFIT and a little bit more about it himself in case I made any mistakes. So thank you, Hadi, and thank you all for coming. So uh, thank you all for coming. I have to stand around the podium because of the uh, online version that it's, it's being streamed right now. So I used to walk uh, a lot. So um, as, as Jonathan said, uh, I have an MD and a PhD in computer sciences. And today I'm trying to talk about a topic that has basically a couple components, including population health, CDSS, and how to use it in a feathered environment like an EHR, PHR, and eventually in a health information exchange uh, model. So uh, because of the CME requirements, I'm disclosing that I did have a financial relationship as an employee with Indiana University, August 08 to 12. I started here at Hopkins, and I do not have any financial interests uh, with uh, commercial entities. Uh, the lecture objectives that was also um, um, included in the handouts is uh, we hope to be able to uh, review what population health IT is or could be, because it's an evolving concept. Uh, what is the clinical practice guideline, uh, the clinical decision support systems, and so on, and how we can apply it in a population health context. Uh, and eventually how this could be used to fill 
uh, multiple gaps that is currently in uh, the larger aspect of uh, the edge IT environment. And of course, the opportunities and challenges and so on. So uh, today I'll go through a very short introduction, give you some background, and it's mostly to get you to know certain topics, like what is clinical informatics, what is public health informatics, um, what is a health information exchange um, uh, concept, uh, population health uh, informatics, and clinical decision support in this context. Um, I'll go very brief because some of you may already know all of these, some may not know, um, so uh, because of the mixed audience, I'll review it. And then I'll briefly talk about uh, Regan Street Institute and, and, and what they had and, and how feasible was what I was doing. Um, and my work there, of course, uh, how to automate that CDS application, contextualize it, put it in, um, um, in, a, in a population health format, uh, and, and what would be the consequences of, of such a thing. I'll touch on, on uh, CFID and its activities and, and what we envision uh, for the center. And then we will have the questions and answer session. Uh, because most of the slides are in a, in a format that sometimes the, you know, um, the next slide will answer your question. So I'll, I'll take the uh, questions at the end of the presentation uh, when you have a better picture of, of uh, uh, the entire, you know, concept here. So, um, of course, uh, um, based on my wife's quote, I'm a doctor who's lost in cyberspace, um, sort of. Um, I joined uh, here uh, as an assistant director of CFIT uh, and an assistant professor back in August. Uh, the director of the um, center is Dr. Jonathan Weiner, uh, who just introduced me. My previous affiliations is listed and my research interest, which is mainly population health IT. But because it is a, a broader, you know, it's a broad concept, it includes many smaller concepts in it, and it's an evolving term. Uh, and, and these two areas are, are my focus areas, which is clinical decision supports and quality measures and personal health records uh, when they relate to population health IT. So when we look at our field, uh, it's expanding. There are, you know, new domains added every day to it. Uh, you have seen these you know, diagrams, and then there are more and more little domains that are added there, and uh, you can see here biomedical informatics, uh, we have bioinformatics, imaging, clinical, consumer health, public health informatics, and so on, and, and they vary between basic research, applied research, and from molecular research to, uh, you know, um, just health, typical health research. And uh, I, I was trained as a clinical informatician, you know, typical applications for a clinical setting. But then I was dragged into consumer health and eventually in public health. And what I found, the, the glue, as Dr. Weiner uh, once mentioned in one of his publications, that the glue between these is uh, what I call it the population health informatics. Uh, and uh, I saw it in that regard. A lot of people mix population health informatics with public health informatics, but we'll try to make a distinction uh, here today. So, uh, as a clinical informatician, uh, what you do, there are tons of different systems that you're working with it, namely the EHR, that's mainly what you work uh, eventually with it, and, and here you can see the Hopkins EPR system, um, and, and there are different elements in, in an EHR, of course, and, and you usually take them as a clinical informatician, try to mine the data and come up with a format that it's meaningful and, and you get something out of it. For example, you come up with clinical decision support um, and you find, oh, if a patient has this and this, then probably we need to do this because I found this. And then you give it back to the clinician. So clinicians actually support clinical informatics that uh, you know, is useful to them. And there are, of course, many other things that a clinical informatician can do, quality measures, knowledge discovery, and et cetera which some may even have non-clinical effects. So um, this is one side of the spectrum. And the other side, the public health informatics, um, what we always wanted to do is um, to get the data from EHRs. But these days, what people do is they manually have to extract data from EHRs, which uh, has a manual process. It takes time. It's not real time. We have problems with standardization of the data, especially when different people are sending it in. And most importantly, we are missing data. A lot of data is just there in the EHRs that are never uh, being reported to uh, the public health. So these reports come in at being aggregated multiple times. It's very hard to get it back to the actual source of data. 
So a lot of times we don't know if, if we find a specific case that is reported to uh, the public health uh, can be located back into the database or not. And we have other sources of data coming in that that's, a lot of them are not connected to our EHRs. So different feeds of data comes to the public health informaticians and they come up with their solutions. Um, here are just some of the registries, uh, syndromic surveillance, uh, databases, quality measures, and so on. And they give it to, of course, the public health department. The problem is there is little feedback going back to the clinician, except from the public health alerts. But if I'm visiting my patient in my office, hmm, that's only the alert coming in. It's not actually helping my interaction with my patient specifically. So health information exchange, of course, came in, multiple EHRs. Uh, they're trying to standardize a lot of data, not all of it. Uh, there are a lot of other sources that some e uh, HIEs, or health information exchange uh, entities, they include, which is not standardized, so we don't know what they need to include, what they shouldn't. Uh, but eventually, HIEs helped a lot, at least to make a big source of data for the public health informaticians. So HIE is playing a big role. Uh, but still, there is the problem of those other sources and giving them meaningful information. So what happens with in population health informatics, as you can see, we have the clinical informaticians, the HIE, the public health informatician. Now, we can add a layer called the population health data warehouse, where we are adding uh, the sources of data that is not usually added in an HIE. Uh, for example, sometimes claims are not included in HIEs. You know, you know we have many HIEs now uh, in the US. Uh, like PHR, some they include, some they don't. So we can come up with a standardized model of a data warehouse that a population health a repository needs to have. And then we can come up with a population health analytic on top of it which will mine the different populations of patients and add an additional layer of support to it. And this is what, what we call a population health informatics. Some people envision that this will be eventually part of an HIE. Some they say, no, this is an additional service that you can add, or it should be parallel. That's a debate. So the good thing is now that the clinical informatician is sending the data to the public health uh, um, department, uh, well, of course, the public health is very happy because you see it's a bigger hour there. They, they get all of the data, and, and it's also in the population health database. And now when they send it back, then this is now very useful for the clinical informatician and eventually the clinician because they have the population health data attached to it. So what does it mean? And that goes into the CDS continuum. So um, we have the clinical informaticians, you see public, uh, population health and public health. And uh, you know, other areas, I just put it in so you can fill some of these you know, uh, gaps. So we have bioinformatics, organizational informatics, and so on. So the typical CDS system, clinical decision support system says, if patient has this and this, do this. Um, and this is based on the data of the one patient at the time. Uh, we can, you know, personalize it and then put even genomic data, and so, some people are trying to do it. So if a patient has X and Y and this certain gene, then do this. Good. That is good. Um, or organizational data in it. Okay, if the patient has X and Y, and if you don't have an MRI in your center, then do this, um, because you don't have an MRI. So that could be another, you know, customization that people are working on. So now population health. Population health, for example, can say, if patient has X and Y and this certain insurance, then do this. So suddenly that analytics, that layer of analytics is adding to your decision support. Or uh, if the patient is from a certain demographics, then do this. And this is all mine based on that population health, uh, that uh, uh, population health analytics that uh, you have added. Uh, or for example, if patient falls in a certain high-risk group, then do this. And of course, the public health informaticians, they always have their own little piece. Hopefully we can integrate those as well. So if the patient lives also in Baltimore, maybe we have to check for lead poisoning as well. This might not be an issue somewhere else, uh, but we can add it in the clinical decision support system. And if you put it all together now, that little CDS system could be highly customized. Instead of just saying patient, if the patient has X and Y, do this. Now we have a much more complete picture of, you know, if the patient has X and Y 
as this gene lives in Baltimore, is high risk, is you know within this demographic, and has this insurance, and 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 then do this. Um, so this will add to the continuum of clinical decision support. So um, let's give you a, a little bit of a context about uh, where I um, I was trained um, and and I work. So Regan Street Institute was established uh, late 60s. So and, and they do clinical informatics, and it, uh, it was uh, based on a huge uh, donation uh, that Sam Regan Street, the king of dishwasher, uh, you know, manufacturing, uh, did because he came to the hospital and saw it's so chaotic. It's why my factory is so much on time, but not the hospital. So let's put computers in them. Um, and then uh, Regan Street Institute receives around $3 million a year from the foundation and around $23 million from grants. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a soft money institute. Um, uh, they're famous for LOINC, one of the standards you probably have heard. But what I want to get to it is this. So they started uh, their EMR or EHR system called RMRS uh, around 1972 or three. So they had their first EHR, home built. We didn't have the EHR renders as we have today. And over time, over 30 years, they collected a lot of patients from that one EHR. And eventually, in 1996, they started IMPC, which is the Indiana Network for Patient Care, and they connected most of the hospitals that are inside the city of Indianapolis. And, and of course, there were like 11 hospitals, um, and, and they, uh, that was sort of a precursor to the notion of uh, a community health information network, or CHIN, which was the old version of HIEs, or Health Information Exchange uh, um, Entities. And of course, um, uh, they um, spin uh, uh, um, the project off to something called Indiana Health Information Exchange. Uh, it's, a, it's a health information uh, exchange um, center that connects around, uh, well, as of today, it's, it's, it's more than this. This is like uh, the, the, uh, the statistics from mid-11. Uh, um, right now, they have around 78 hospitals, uh, what I know. 78 hospitals are connected in real time together, and there are around 22, 3,000 physicians that are connected to it, like outpatient, like physician offices. And... Uh, um, many records are in this. And this was a very good source of population health. And that was what, uh, why it was feasible to do population health uh, there. So a uh, couple of things that uh, has been done uh, in Regan Street. Uh, and this is back in the days, for example, they, they found out, if you see the, the larger circle here, this is the missing data portion that was stored in the HIE uh, that was not being reported to the public health agencies. This is like the passive reporting uh, that was made by hospitals and health departments to the public health, uh, and this was the missing piece. So as you can see, HIEs will get a lot of data that is usually missed. It's because you know people don't have the time to report, or it's just being aggregated or missed, or uh, any other reason. So, um, and then they showed, uh, for example, most of the um, uh, reports that are made to the public health departments, they come from claims, and claims are late because it should go through the insurance company, and then the insurance company needs to uh, report it to the uh, public health department. And, and they call it, you know, let's use the actual data in an EHR in real time and report it. And, and as you can see in the first diagram, this is uh, the number of days and the number of cases that reported, see if, if they just do it based on the uh, chief complaint that it's in an EHR, it, it goes in much faster than the older methodology that takes many days to be reported. And of course, that becomes very important in biosurveillance and all of other things that uh, are time dependent. Um, and based on that, they created this notifiable condition detector for CDC where um, anything that comes in into the HIE is matched with the Dwyer um, um, criteria, which is the CDC requirements of, of notifiable diseases, and they can just send it in. So uh, the CDC can find in real time which hospitals saw certain things that should be reported. And the nice thing is nobody needs to click on report anymore. As soon as you just save it, 
in your EHR saying, you know, the patient has this diagnosis, it's being reported. And the syndromic surveillance service, which is basically tracking multiple things at the same time, and, and you can graph them and see whether you have many cases in one area that you don't have in the other one. And as you can see here, this was, I guess, the flu that, that they had, uh, and, and they were way ahead of CDC's you know, flu system, and they found that peak uh, because they could tap into the HIE. Well, at the time, this was IMPC indeed indeed, um, the, the older version of a uh, HIE in Indiana. So um, these, these are all very good for public health people, but remember, this doesn't translate into a clinical interaction. So that's where the population health needs to come in. So I started as a clinical informatician, typical clinical informatics. And uh, what I was assigned to is uh, let's improve our clinical decision support system. Uh, because uh, what they had, they had a bunch of rules that they needed to apply, and those rules, they were getting old, their database structure was changing, everything was changing, and they could not update their rules. So that was uh, when I came in to be able to automate that process. Uh, just to know what is a CDSS here, so we know we have clinical practice guidelines, or CPGs, that are published you know, by medical associations, and, and here ARC has a, 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 a national uh, guideline clearance house, uh, that are a bunch of texts, of course, uh, you know, that doctors can read, and they need to follow this. Uh, and what happens is um, um, there are, oops, I jumped one of them. So there are computerized versions of this. Uh, there are languages that, you know, has that information. And then here are two languages, like art or care language. Care language was made in Regency. You probably don't know it, but Arden was made in Columbia, um, Jello, uh, and a couple other languages. Uh, that uh, have this clinical practice guidelines in a computerized format. And what happens is they usually take this, like that care language, and they write an actual program to run that rule. So for every rule, they write a little bit of the program. Uh, and then just think about maintaining it every time they have to write a new program when the rule changes. And then uh, they had to run it for one patient at a time. That was the program. The program couldn't run it for all patients. If you want to run it for all patients, it took couple weeks to run it for all of the patients in an HIE. And then, uh, you know, you can see the pop-up on your screen, right? That's the clinical decision support that uh, we do. Again, this is not based on the books that you read, because in the textbooks, it's much fancier, but this is the reality on the ground. Uh, it is very manual, very uh, exhaustive, uh, and if there is no knowledge base, no nothing like a, an engine that does everything automatically. It's all like a simple uh, um, pieces of programming. So problems with the system, of course, you cannot uh, replicate uh, most of these CDS things. So if I run that little, uh, uh, write that little piece of program, I cannot bring it here at Hopkins. That is a completely different system here, the database structure and everything else. Uh, another problem is um, the, it could not be shared. The, and the knowledge uh, that uh, is, is created from it. And then there are articles about it, why a CDS system worked in one unit that didn't work in the other one. And it's because they're very much adapted to your environment. Um, most of these uh, clinical practice guideline uh, syntaxes uh, are not standardized either. And that's one of the problems. Like Arden syntax, when you look at it, it's all based on Columbia's database. Or, or care language is all based on our database. Uh, Regan Street database, shouldn't say ours. Uh, but here, you might have a different system that is based on our system here. So that was another problem. <laughs> and of course, the hard coding things and maintaining them. So we had around, um, I guess, 400 rules um, that was in effect back in, I don't know, let's say late 80s. And it, there was only less than 50 in effect um, back in 2011 because we could maintain, uh, you had to rewrite everything. And remember, these rules sometimes are very complicated. It's not just a one-line rule. So what I said, uh, we have this system, right? The manual processing and so on. I can uh, try to jump through it and automate it for all of the different languages and create a way that I can run it against all patients at the time. What if I get that little piece of the computerized CPG language, like ordinance uh, care, uh, and then generate an SQL, like, you know, uh, uh, um, SQL query that you can run against a relational database. 
And this happened. And uh, of course, when you do this, because it's independent of your database design, that was how it was designed, then you can run it against any database you like. So you can transfer your little SQL and run it anywhere you want. Uh, not the SQL, the, the engine that creates the SQL. And then I also looked at quality measures. That was what I wanted to do. And if you look at this, because now I can run it against all uh, the patients, this is where we go into population health informatics. So uh, I went through multiple phases, which is um, very you know, uh, convoluted, this slide. You, I don't want to explain everything. I'll show it in the next slide in the diagram. Uh, so I got the CPG. Um, of course, people have created the care card and name it all of these little pieces. And I was not you know, involved in that piece. That's a lot of NLP involved in it, how we can automate that process. But mostly, it's manually done. Uh, uh, but the problem was the lexical integration and standardizing those languages, making sure that you take out any um, of the terms that are highly customized based on their own database, and then you just use the ones that are based on the standard terminologies. So that was a little piece that I had to do. Eventually, the CPG consortium, that you probably have heard about it, uh, they're trying to standardize all of these uh, languages and put them on a cloud that you can just query and get all of the up-to-date uh, computerized CPGs. Regenstrief was part of that. So if that is, you know, materialized, then I don't need to do the lexicon integration anymore. What I did, I used the power of XML. Uh, it's just a, uh, you know, markup language uh, with a lot of tags. And uh, I, I did that syntactic mapping here where I, you can parse that language and put it in an XML format. And then, well, the XML, you can't run it against a database. Then I used an XSL uh, transition, which is the semantic integration. Again, XSL, it's, it's sort of a templating language for XML. And then what I generated, it was SQLs, uh, regardless of your database structure, because that XSL uses your database structure. Um, and uh, the last piece was running it, and I'll show the results to you right now. And I'm working right now on quality measures, because quality measures are, are fairly similar, um, but uh, they're more into the population health uh, than the actual CPGs. So I took care, created XML, created SQL. I also did part of the syntax. And this is just uh, um, um, one example to show you uh, how they look like. See, this is like a piece of program just saying, like English, you can read it. Begin, block this. If this is this cholesterol, then do this and do this, do that. Um, if dense, typical programming. Um, care language or Arden, you can even look up Arden. This is XML. If you look, there are tags, uh, very much like HTML or you know any other tagging um, language, and that little piece is now translated into this XML, and it's all standardized. And then this is the SQL. Uh, it's just a piece of it. Select this from this table of the database and do this and do that. Um, so it uh, all happens in real time. Uh, they convert all together. And remember, some of these are huge. I had a Carol rule that had like 200 lines. And when I created the SQL query, it was 5,000 lines. So you can't generate that SQL uh, manually because it's just uh, not readable. You can't even read it anymore. So limitations, of course, I don't work with the FreeText CPG. That's somebody else creating FreeText CPG and creating Arden and Care or whatever. Um, we have problems with standard terminology, like I always. Um, uh, we have problems with fuzzy or probabilistic representation of these languages. One of the problems we have is none of these languages has fuzzy terms in it. Like if the hemoglobin is high, do this. Uh, they always say if it's more than a certain limit. But sometimes when you look at clinical practice guidelines, they say if it's high, do this. And then nobody knows what is high. If, if, if the patient is in pain, what is pain? You know, define it. Um, so that is one of the problems we have. Uh, if we have mismatched data granularity, that means if your database is not recording what it should be recorded, uh, then the rule would not bring anything back. So you run the SQL and nothing comes back because you never recorded the pain that the patient had, for example. Uh, and of course, uh, <laughs> all of these rules are mutually exclusive, and that's one of the problems we have in, in the clinical decision support system anyways. Uh, you cannot combine two SQLs and say, I came up with a new one. Uh, so they're all exclusive from each other. 
where can you use it? Of course, I right now we can use it in our CPO is a uh, computerized physician order entry and run it for one patient at the time. Good. So that was what they were doing, and then we automated this, and it's now faster. But you can now use it for populations. Remember, you can run it for the entire database of an HIE. And then what happens here, I can um, not only do it for, you know, uh, Arden syntax or C, uh, CARE syntax, I can do it for national quality forms, e-measures, and et cetera, and, and do quality monitoring, which is very important for entities like ACOs, uh, you know, um, and um, all of the, you know, uh, organizations that are trying to lower the cost. Um, I can bring in PHR data, which I, I started it, but then I moved here. Um, that could be tethered PHRs, PHRs that are interconnected with EHRs. Um, and then, uh, of course, we can use it for public health inf uh, informatics purposes, that it's of concern to the public, the traditional public health informatics people, and the transitions of the care. Um, so these are just the areas that you can use. So let's look at the data. Uh, quickly look at the data and see how it looked like. So I had a subset of a subset of the HIE because I did not have the clearance to work with the entire HIE data. The, our HIE had around uh, 14 million patients, unique patients. This is more than the double of Indiana's population because we had a lot of guests coming in probably or a lot of people actually passed away. So uh, that could be also a reason. Um, so um, I had access to around half a million patients, and you can see this is the database I worked with. And I took 40, uh, 70 rules, around 70 care uh, rules that were like the most used care rules, and I converted them into SQLs and ran them against um, the uh, HIE that I had access to. And you can see here, these are all of the rules. I can't put all of the 74. And how much would it take to run it against one patient? It's all less than a second. Good. So you can use it in a CPOE. And you can run it against the entire half a million people you have in and, and the, the first uh, in the middle column here. You can see it's, it's feasible. It's not like real time, less than a second. But the public health officials, they don't need, you know, in a real time in terms of, you know, finding uh, certain things like the cholesterol levels in the entire population of a half a million patients. Because this goes into population health analytics, even if you can do it overnight and, and create all, update all of your algorithms, uh, that's more than enough. Uh, as you can see, I, I ran all of the rules in less than 1,200 seconds. So 70 rules against half a million patients. So here, for example, uh, now remember that's an HIE. Many institutes are connected. The nice thing is you can run it and compare institutes together. Who is doing better? Uh, and following certain, uh, you know, clinical decision uh, support uh, rules. You can see here institute number one um, uh, hits certain rules way more than the other ones. This is, of course, questionable. Maybe they didn't collect the data that they needed for this part, or they're just not following up. Uh, and that could be a further process to find out why. Uh, but as you can see, they're working in some areas more than the others. And you can actually take that little piece, sum it up, and see each institute. So these are all of the institutes that I have access to. And then how many times they are following any of those 70 rules. Um, so now you can compare them. And I, I you know, just uh, ranked them. And you can see some of them actually followed way more than the others. And of course, and these are academic hospitals. Um, mainly. Um, and, and if you do it based on population, uh, it is um, not that much considered, um, you know, uh, compared to, to the other ones. Anyway, so you can start, you know, um, digging into this data and then find a lot of different patterns, uh, population health patterns that you couldn't see otherwise. So, and you can do some nice visualizations. Uh, and uh, what I call it, uh, all of these diagrams, there are different fingerprints and of, of quality or CDS, uh, you know, um, um, what I called it, uh, it was uh, what are they comply, uh, CDS compliance. Um, so you can put them all together and now see in Indiana, between all of these hospitals, there is a big gap somewhere why nobody is doing that piece. Uh, or, or maybe we don't have the data that should be collected. And you could also go into the medical error piece where you can see, okay, they should have done it, but they didn't do it. Um, and, and they missed the patient. 
and, and you can create uh, you know, uh, the same thing for each institute. So you can see here the number of missed times, percentage of, of, of the missed of all of these rules for one of the institutes. And you can see they have missed some of them way more than the others. This has nothing to do whether they collected or not. This is really missing something. And you can do it for, uh, and you can find an average for each institute and compare it with another institute. Um, so this is uh, something that is very useful in comparing the quality of care given uh, to institutes based on the finest level of data for each patient at the time. So I'm looking at each patient at the time. This is not a report that was made by somebody, a hospital administrator. This is based on clinical data directly coming from the patient. And here I could just do some nice visualization, see uh, the missed rules, percentages of missed rules, all of the rules and institutes. Um, so that creates a nice way for people to come up with different policies and maybe we have to follow something um, along certain lines. We had a nice uh, website. Uh, uh, this is an internal website, so you, you won't be able to actually access it from outside. Um, and uh, you could take any rule you like in real time. Um, you know, put your own little care language if you want, click, and it converted it into XML, SQL, ran it against the database and showed all of the results on, on, on screen. So that's the nice thing. So no matter what is a new rule coming in, you can run it against your database in real time. Um, um, so that was the nice piece that you showed and it was useful for the actual application. And of course, uh, this is a typical, you know, message that would go in. Uh, they already had this, but this is now facilitated through this uh, work where you can give some clinical decision support pop-ups as we usually do. But remember, I said this could be much more customized now based on that CBS continuum where you can add the population health data as well. Of course, I started uh, looking because I love working with consumer health informatics solutions as well. I started doing this for the patients, so let's create a little nice thing for the patient directly through their PHR. So I looked at diabetic patients. This is a glucometer. It's not a cell phone, uh, but it, it looks like a cell phone. It's connected. It's by, uh, It's connected through 3G, and and they accept uh, certain messages to come in real time. So it sends the, you know, the readings, and then it, you can feed back. Uh, it was from Telcare. I, uh, they just got their FDA uh, approval um, back in May sometime. So I started working with them, and, and we hope to have our little CDS engine there and come up with, I, I call it the population-based CDS, that it's, you know, uh, massaged for the patients. Uh, and, and if I can find patterns of, of certain patients who are taking the, uh, you know, readings, and then maybe I can add a new layer to it. Uh, but again, I, I moved, so that is, uh, one of the grad students is actually following up on this. Uh, but I, I'm not uh, anymore involved actively. So uh, what is population-based uh, CDS? What is the difference between the old version and the new version? Um, uh, so what happens is when you track back um, in, in a public health department, and if you get the data, we know that, for example, we have that many you know, reports from this population, but we can never track it back to the individual patient. Uh, a lot of times you won't be able to do it, but now we can do it because it's a CDS based. I, I looked it up based on one clinical patient, uh, you know, at the time. Uh, the models that are used currently in epidemiology is, is usually statistical, but now this is rule based. Uh, again, it's it's one at the time. It's rule based. It's not hard coded. This is dynamic uh, because I can change the rules anytime I want. Uh, can I integrate it into any HIE I want? Maybe this way, but this already exists. And I'm working with CRISP, the HIE version here in Maryland, to be able to do the same thing. Um, so, and, and, and if we can access the data, we can definitely do it. Doesn't need that much, that much of a change. It's just a new database structure I need to feed into the uh, system. And it has a complete representation. It's not only EHR anymore. And it's SQL driven. It's, it's not a program indeed. So you remember this diagram I just showed that we can find the pike, um, you know, where it, it actually peaked. Uh, now, what happens is uh, if we do the same thing with the system that we created, now we can even reveal the causes of why they maybe they missed something and we have these, you know, uh, peaks of a certain syndrome. So that is a nice thing that we can add. Uh, now based on the population health analytic layer. 
So I joined CFIT uh, and uh, I have around, uh, I guess, a um, couple of minutes just left. Um, so our mission here is to improve the health and well-being of the population by using uh, the state-of-the-art information technology, specifically population health informatics. And, and then provide it to the stakeholders like the public health agencies, private healthcare organizations, or even the clinicians. Uh, because you remember that feedback going back to the clinician, uh, that is also important because that motivates them to provide the data to us. And the focus would be, um, you know, in terms of the technology, the EHRs, PHRs, and other um, uh, interventions that are targeted at uh, special communities, uh, you know, special need populations, uh, certain, uh, um, you know, consumers that are cared by, um, you know, IDS systems and so on. So it it's, has the public health flavor on it. Uh, director is Dr. Weiner, and this is my website. It's very easy. It's jhsph.edu slash cfit. So I encourage you to go. This is our old website. We are going for a 2.0 website, so it's... Uh, we are excited about this, and hopefully we will go for a 3.0 uh, next summer. So as you can see here, CFIT is going to work with uh, multiple entities at Hopkins. Um, don't want to go through uh, all of them. The most important thing is that in terms of um, you know the funding that we are going to target, in addition to grants, we are targeting heavily the industry partnership. Um, because I think the, uh, we think the industry... I talked about ACOs, for example, or the consumer health informatics piece and so on. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, partners out there that we hope to attract. And, and we're doing this based on MIT Media Lab, if you have heard about it. And then they have a very strong partnership with the industry. So um, you remember the meaningful use is, is out, uh, the high tech app and all of the money. And, and the last two stages, actually the <laughs> stage two came out a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago. And um, uh, there, there is more and more about population health in it. Like even the CDS, they're trying to pe push people, do certain CDS rules so eventually that could be shared between people. So they're trying to go from, you know, sort of a trickle low from to top layer approach. Um, and um, we are working with CRISP, of course, uh, to, to bring in the population-based HIEs here. You can see uh, CRISP uh, is, is taking in a fair number of different sources of data. PHR is still not part of it, but they hope to bring it in. Uh, they have their master patient index form uh, that it's based on open source uh, solutions like Connect and Mirth. Um, but um, what happens is because they're open source, easy to interact with, uh, we can add that additional layer of population health and then bring all of the CDS rules that are triggered based on that additional layer back to the individual stakeholders of that HIE. So if I'm sharing my data, at least I'm getting something from the HIE. This is just a different representation. You don't want to go through it. It's just providers, patients, and the public health. And, and the two, my version of uh, population health informatics 2.0 and what it means. We have certain R&D priorities here that it's uh, being involved, uh, evolved over time. Uh, uh, we have a very strong NLP team here at Hopkins uh, that we are working with on, uh, on certain pattern recognitions and, and use it for uh, population-based interventions. So this is one thing we are following. Uh, we are using on consumer-focused um, applications and how to bring those, you know, applications inside population health. Um, as I worked back at Regan Street, I'm, I'm working on a certain e-measures and how to uh, measure the quality of care given uh, in real time, uh, you know, and in a dynamic format. And, and you know, uh, identify high-risk populations. That's one of the, uh, you know, mandates on the public health side. Um, that it's um, unfortunately left alone because the clinicians, they say this is public health, public health says this is clinical. So we hope that uh, as population health, we can uh, uh, focus on that piece. Um, and also, you know, typical public health informatics uh, and the uh, evidence generation research. This is a list that it's being involved in, and we hope to see more of, uh, you know, the clinical informaticians uh, that are uh, here online at Hopkins, uh, you know, campus would start collaborating with us on, on certain projects. Um, and, uh, again, because we are harvesting clinical informatics, a lot of our solutions 
are based on clinical informatics solutions, um, and, and we harvest the population held on top of it. So thank you uh, for attending. Um, I hope I, I was on time. It's 1.02. Um, and uh, now I'm open for questions and answers. Before you do that. Right. Now, now you can see why we hired him. So uh, a tour de force in many different areas, Hadi. Uh, thank you. Excellent talk. Uh, we have, and it's right on time to boot. He's a very experienced uh, uh, lecturer, so, and, and many of you will, will uh, see that as he, he begins to be integrated more in the educational. But now we have about 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, what we'll do is, of course, those of you here live uh, in the Chevy Chase room, uh, uh, Ed, Ed Bunker will, will be the uh, uh, whatever uh, role, uh, but the mic man. Oprah. Oprah, Oprah yeah. Uh, and it, we need to use the microphone because uh, those at home will hear. In addition, um, those of you at, at home here live can communicate with us uh, via JH Informatics GR for Grand Rounds. And those of you regulars know how to do it. We'll be monitoring the tweets. Is that correct? Any more guidance that we give them? Okay. Any, any tweets that have come in? No tweets yet. But, and those of you listening to this on archive, we hope there are many of you, uh, I think just contact us by, by email. So take, I guess, questions mainly here. And we have about, about 15 minutes. So let's go. Uh, Dr. Hadi, how, how do you plan or how do you envision integrating the CDSS at the point of care? So we are implementing EPIC here throughout the Hopkins Health System. Uh, do you envision where a physician seeing a patient entering the uh, entering some of their uh, soap notes in, and it like you have an alert pop up or something that says, "Hey, you." I'd recommend an MRI versus a CT or a PET versus right. something else. Um, okay. Um, it could be done. Epic may not be the best system. Um, so I'll try to go and then, and, you know, just tell exactly uh, based on the scenario that you said. Epic is, is fairly closed in terms of, you know, their clinical decision support system. Uh, they have a mumps date, um, you know, a, a hierarchical database uh, that you cannot have real-time access to it. They have a shadow relational that you can access it, but that's too late for a pop-up on screen. Um, so um, in terms of the feasibility, it'll be pretty tough. Um, it is not easy to do it with Epic. Uh, there are other vendors that they have more open solutions that you can read their data in real-time and pop something on screen as well. But remember, what we are doing is, um, although it may have a real-time application, but whatever you're doing in the back should, doesn't need to be real, real-time. So most of the population health analytics is happening in the back and then changes those rules and what to show on screen overnight because we found the pattern of certain things that is happening in, a, you know, in this population, for example. Um, so next morning, when the doctor is using the system, now their local CDS system is updated based on what we provided in terms of population health. And then they see a new message. So for us, uh, in terms of research, I, I don't want to talk operationally, in terms of research, we do not need to have it in real time. Uh, and, and remember, we want to work with Chris. Um, um, and, and it's sort of a top-down approach where we get all of the data and then we know the linkages back to the actual patients if we find certain patterns and how to present it on screen. Uh, but when it comes to operation, um, I, I don't know. And, and operationally, if, if we want to go that far and implement it or not, um, and then plus remember that most of these uh, vendor systems, um, their CDS is not a real CDS that it's not even the simplified one that we are talking. Most of it is just templates and, and forms that are pre-populated. Most of these, you know, uh, uh, alerts, uh, you may not be able to change it easily. So uh, if you want to see it in operation, what we have done in a clinic, you can do it definitely in places that they have their own EHR or the EHR vendor that they, has, they have worked with, give them the opportunity to do this. Uh, here, I suspect that we could do it um, at the beginning, maybe over time, maybe. You know, everybody has the hype to get it, so let's get it first, and then over time we might 
be able to figure out. There are ways, I've, I've read some of the EPIC documentations on their user web, uh, um, what is it, userweb.epic.com, something. Uh, and uh, there are some ways to get into real-time data, almost real-time, uh, but um, it is not an easy task. So, uh, okay. Uh, great, thank you. I am I'm very interested in your XML translation services layer. That really think I think is a problem that we commonly saw, have to address as informaticists. And I, I kind of had a couple issues that I hope to understand a little bit better. Is it is there any um, abstraction or standardized vocabulary that it's tied to? And, and the, I guess the, the use case I had, you had a, a good use case in there for your clinical guideline where, so your system says the sex is equal to male. And you then convert that into XML, but then in the EPIC system, the, the actual field is gender, and instead of male, it's either M, F, or O, instead of male or female or other. And so do you solve right. those okay. types of problems? It, it does seem like a, a, it's a translation problem, but is it trying to also, in right. trying to enforce controlled vocabularies or tied into an ontology? That would be the interoperability you know, problem. So, so what happens is this. When I generate the SQL command, this is based on standard terminology that is defined by HL7, which is usually SNOMED. So I have SNOMED, and the XML is in an HL7 format. It's, it's based on you know, how RIM is, is formatting it. So it's a sort of a CDA. Um, and HL7 has also started a group called the Clinical Decision Support Group that is coming up even you know, uh, um, for, for a unified version of their XML that can end at the rule in it, like we have the CPGs, Arden syntax, and so on, then we have an HL7 XML version of it, which would be ideal because I don't need to do the XML anymore, right? I use the standard terminologies. So what happens is then when I want to convert that to an SQL, I know the messy part starts because, as you said, databases may have different attributes and how they store the data might be also based on different terminologies. So how can I locate it in the database and how can I map it uh, in terms of the actual value? Maybe somebody writes it male, somebody M, somebody zero, somebody something else. Um, so what happens is um, in that conversion, I have created an external file for the DBA of the destination that can put it, um, so it's, it has all of the standard terminologies uh, for that rule that they want to work. And the DBA needs to tell me where in the database it is, which table, and what is the attribute's name, and uh, what are the values that they use, whether there is a different value or no, they're just using the same. So I can tell you this, if you're using one of those standard terminologies like SNOMED, ICD, and so on, you should be fine because I have all of the conversion tables and that could automatically happen. The, the, the last part that you can never control is the structure of your database, right? So the structure of the database might be different. So you're storing it in, in that table, I'm storing it in another table. Uh, I can tell you one simple example. Uh, at Regan Swift, the INPC used to store everything. Uh, all of the clinical variables are in one huge table. It's uh, around 40 terabytes of data in one table with around 100 partitions. It's a huge Oracle database, um, data table. And, and it works, it's very fast for some reason. Um, but, um, uh, but what happens is in another setting, it might be 1,000 different tables which are smaller. Um, you just need to give me the data you know, uh, um, design and then the rest is, is done. Remember, you just do it once. Um, and then any new rule that comes in, uh, you can run it. Uh, so yes, there is an additional effort in making sure that your standards, they work, and the database design. Database design, there are solutions I've heard that they can do mapping of database designs, but it's very complicated. So I would say if the DBA, the database administrator, does it manually, that's the best. Yes. Uh, just a, a related question. In working, if this is dedicated to one institution or one network, it probably would work fine. If we're trying to reach out to the smaller hospitals, primary care network hospitals may not be part of the one EHR. Um, a, a good example of what they've done at Cleveland Clinic in using a semantic data store using RDF as their engine, allowing them to do semantic integration. 
and and really federate the data rather than aggregate and do a lot of ETL mappings and so on, but actually really being the primary management tool being their dictionary and ontology versus ETLs and mappings. Have you any thoughts on that? Um, actually, um, it is, I don't want to say it's exactly the same, but it's very similar to what uh, Indiana Health Information Exchange is doing. So in, in, in Indiana Health Information Exchange, it's a federated model and it's a consistent model, as you said. So the semantics are in, in place. So every vendor, uh, every uh, stakeholder, like hospitals, uh, even physician offices and so on, when they are part of HIE, their data is replicated on a, fit, uh, on, on a let's say, a second, a mirror database uh, that could be either hosted by them or by Indiana Health Information Exchange. And they own it. So whenever they want to get out of HIE, they can just take their server back and say, I'm not sharing it anymore. But at the time that it goes into the mirror, it's all based, uh, it's standardized. So everybody who joins needs to go through a manual process making sure that the standards are in place. So everything that it's coming in. So, but HIE, the Indiana HIE, does not own any of those servers. Uh, at the time that you need a patient, when you run a query, it goes through all of them because it's standardized and it gives you the data. So that's a massive patient index and, and it goes into realm of, you know, the um, um, DVDs, RDFs, and then all of those things, you know, come up uh, there. So, yes, and, and the good thing is CRISP here at the HIE that we have here, and they presented just a couple of weeks ago here, uh, David Parks and, and, and uh, his people, and they're, they're following uh, almost the same model because the open source solution uh, that is called Connect, um, and that it's um, sort of a government initiative, um, uh, is, is using the same model. They think it, it is a federated, consistent model. We have um, what you mentioned is um, the monolithic model where everything goes into one central database and they start storing everything all together. Um, and, and that is the UK's um, NHS uh, version that I, I haven't heard about it. I'm not sure if it's operational yet. Um, so, uh, and that is always a problem, you know, forcing everybody to put it in one big database. Um, I'm not sure if it's feasible. But yes, th there, this solution that I've mentioned here, uh, it's more of a research solution. It could be a per, uh, you know, put into operations if people want to do this. But just to saying this is you know, a turnkey solution, buy it from me, this is not a commercial solution. So it won't work right away. You have to match your databases and so on. But if, if, a, if an organization wants to, you know, handle their own CDS system, they can use such a, you know, solution somewhere in their framework. Okay. Well, not only but a few closing comments. Well, again, I'll reiterate that uh, you can see why we hired him. And I, I, one of the goals was to uh, introduce him to the community, although many of you have, have met him. And we look forward to collaboration uh, here at Hopkins and uh, military and with, with uh, 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 friends that may be out there uh, uh, listening. And as you appreciate, we have a lot of challenges close to home, you know, with any provider institution such as our own in any clinical setting and, and many of you are working on that. But, you know, those of us in public health and those of us, many of you, that are interested in community issues or national issues or even global issues uh, realize that it's, uh, you know, factorial. And you can see with someone like Hadi, uh, uh, we, we have a, a, at least a really good start. And moreover, it's something that we can't do insular, uh, you know, just here uh, at, at Johns Hopkins. And certainly, you know, just with informatics, it needs to be collaborative with public health and with vendor community and with the government and, and, uh, and, and, and others as well. Uh, so I'd encourage, um, as over, over the, the coming weeks, coming months, those of you that have practicums or, or dissertations, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to reach out to Hadi or, or CFIT, the Center for Population Health IT. We are very anxious, like many things at, at Hopkins, uh, you know, the sort of core, you know, we don't go out and hire 20 people because we have 24,000 people here. So the goal is to hire a few key people, and Hadi is certainly one of them. Some of you have met Suji Saria, who is uh, also going to be at CFIT. She's a, a computer scientist, uh, joint between uh, uh, computer science department at, at Homewood Whiting School as well as here, and also 
do work elsewhere in, in the campus and hope to have a few other hires. But the main engine will be all of you. You know, the faculty here, the students here, and then we are developing very uh, aggressive relationships with government organizations and, and, and uh, community and vendor organizations, and we hope to be a conduit for many of you. Uh, since I'm standing in for, for Harold, and uh, at this point, Harold would remind everybody, uh, both live and uh, 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 online, of our, our next uh, uh, Grand Rounds next week, uh, 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 Dr. Michael Boland uh, uh, in, in uh, ophthalmology, also DHSI, will be talking about uh, uh, reminders uh, for medication adherence for glaucoma patients using uh, automated telecommunication. So I hope that you can join us. And again, one last time, let's thank Hadi. And, and uh, any of you watching this on archive, please feel free to contact Hadi via email. He should be easy to find. And those of you here in person, please stay after and, and, and chat with Hadi. Thank you for coming.